Good morning, folks. Welcome to our discovery class. Uh, good morning, Carol. Good morning, John. I'm glad to be here, and happy Valentine's Day to everybody out yes. there. She's dressing seasonally Thank these you days. Very much. <laughs> uh, she's got a red shirt on. I, I have my blue shirt on. So if you're if making sure the color on your device is accurate. There you go. Um, but anyway, happy Valentine's Day. Uh, Sarah, I've already asked you, will you be my Valentine? <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, but you're glad you have her with us. Today, glad to have you with us. Today we're in... Uh, Luke chapter 10, mm -hmm. the story of the Good Samaritan, and let's pray, and yes. we'll jump in. God, we thank you for the day. Thank you for the way you love us on this Valentine's Day. God, we only we know love because you first loved us, as, as John writes, and so uh, we're thankful for that. Allow us uh, on this Valentine's Day, as this passage uh, speaks, to love our neighbors and to reach out to those, um, whoever they might be. And that's the point of this story. So, uh, God, may the words of our mouths and the meditations of our heart be pleasing to you. For it's your name we pray and believe. Amen. Amen. And as I said, we're on the story of the Good Samaritan today. And, and you've heard the story many times. Uh, I won't try to put a number, but it's a story that we're all familiar with. One of those stories that even if you're not a church person, even if you're not a believer... You know the story of the Good Samaritan. A man comes up to Jesus and asks, what, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus asks him, don't you know the law? Kind of as in a sarcastic way. And the guy says, yeah. And he quotes two verses. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. And Jesus says, you got to check plus. Go and do it. And the guy goes, well, who's my neighbor? And then he tells the story of two religious people walk by and see a man lying in the road. And walk past, and the, and the Samaritan comes by, sees him, and takes care of him. And uh, Jesus says, which one of these three is the guy's neighbor? And the guy couldn't even say Samaritan. He said, the last guy. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. And so the, the point of us today is go and do likewise. But in the, con in the broader context of our theme for this eight weeks, resolute, Jesus having set his face toward Jerusalem, um, I, we, we chose this passage of Scripture because in this passage of Scripture, Jesus is saying, uh, as he's resolutely walking toward the cross, the law doesn't answer the question. The law, the, when it comes to eternal life, when it comes to your eternity, when it, when it comes to you experiencing the abundance of life, the answer is not in the law. Jesus is saying, I am on the way to Jerusalem and that's where the answer is found. And so that's why we're dealing with this passage uh, in this theme of resolute. And with that said, uh, Carol, teach us this morning. I would love to. Glad to be here. And I had true confessions this morning when John first said or get, laid it out to the walk to Easter. And he included this. I thought, I know this one. You know, this is going to be not boring, but, and boy, was I wrong. I learned a lot this week, so I hope, hope you get the feeling of that. So the question that was asked is, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And this this person comes, and we're told in this one that he's he's one of the scribes or one of the, you know, leaders. That, that was the same question, though, so we don't miss this, that was asked by the rich young ruler in Matthew and in Mark, so that this may be a similar situation it just being told in a different way, just so that you, those are the same two questions. And Jesus, as John said, very quickly answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, my, your soul, and your strength, and your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I just want to stop there, because the first one is Deuteronomy 6, 5, and the second one is Leviticus nineteen eighteen. Why do I stop there? Because those two scriptures would have been scriptures, um, if, if those of you haven't heard of a phylactery, it were, were little boxes. When I was in Israel, I saw some of them that they have cords and they have boxes on the front of their foreheads, the real devout Jews, or on their wrists. And they put scriptures in those boxes. Interestingly enough, they carry the scriptures externally, but we want to look internally. Where are we carrying things today? And so I sort of want to open it with that. But then Jesus says, you're correct. Do this and you will live eternal life. Now, interestingly enough, Jesus at that point left it there. He didn't say, but let me ask you a third question. 
it's this guy coming back. I think in almost a pompous way, forgive my word there maybe, but boasting, well, then who is my neighbor, teacher? And, and so there might have been a little bit of a hint of he was pushing Jesus at this point. I think when I reread this this week, John, I think he might have been pushing. Well, who is my neighbor? And, and ladies and gentlemen, I have to stop this week. That question has plagued me. Who is my neighbor? Who am I in this parable? And I, I, I'm not sure that it has ever hit me as hard as it hit me this week because there are six people in this parable now. Now let's just let's just pull that apart a little bit because we're talking about a neighbor, and we all know that with a neighbor, if you're really going to love somebody, faith without works is dead. Now there was the person who was robbed and just just to back us up one more minute this is from jerusalem remember john a couple weeks ago said is jerusalem high or low it's way up there it's 2300 feet above sea level all right jericho interestingly enough is right near the dead sea mm -hmm. and it's 1300 <clears throat> feet below sea level so from where he went here to here there was a drop of 3600 feet over a 20 mile road that had a lot of twisty turns and crags and everything. And they actually called this uh, thing <laughs> the red or the bloody way because so many people were caught and beaten up on this road that there were advisories up until the early 1900s. Don't travel this road alone. Travel it in a caravan or at least in a small group because there were multiple places people could jump out and get people there. And I had never known about the geography of that area. So I just wanted to throw that in because he he probably shouldn't have been traveling alone. So that there's the person, we don't know anything about him except that he was attacked, he was beaten up, he was left for dead. So the first person who comes by them is the uh, the priest. Now, the priest understand that, and, I'm, and I'm taking you back to, I have to take you back to the Old Testament, don't I? Sorry yeah. about that. To Numbers 1911, if you want to check me out. He saw this guy, but if he touched him or helped him with the blood and everything, he would have been unclean for seven days. What does that mean? He couldn't have then gone to the temple and he couldn't have completed his duties. So he chose ceremony over charity. Carol, do you choose ceremony over charity. I had to ask myself that this week. Where am I? Do I do things right or I do the right thing? And there's a big difference there between those two. Okay, so that's why he justified that he could walk on. The next guy came was a Levite. Now, every priest is a Levite, but not every Levite is a priest, okay? So that the Levite comes along and Apparently, there was a ruse back then that I learned, John, that, that the robbers would sometimes lie down and look like they'd been beaten up mm -hmm. to get somebody to come out to help them, and then they would attack the person who was helping them. That would stop things and maybe get them down off their animal that they were traveling on or whatever. So he may have peeked over, but then thought, yeah, I may get, be getting set up here, so I'm going to run on. And then... Um, the, the, the Levite would did that. Then a Samaritan came along. Now, we all know that the Samaritan race was a hated race. It was considered half-breeds after the Assyrians in 722 BC came and intermarried and carried people off. We know that. But what I didn't know this week that I had to say to John, this was a big learning curve for me, in John 8, 48, and I, when I read this, I said, that's not true. And I went, <laughs> Jesus was called a Samaritan mm -hmm. by the, the scribes and the Pharisees because they were trying to accuse him of heresy. So you're as bad as a Samaritan. So Jesus Christ was accused of this. But when he says, along came a Samaritan, this, this learned person is probably thinking, well, now he's brought the villain into this story. Right. Now I'm going to look really good because <clears throat> I, you know. He's obviously talking about a bad person. And then the Samaritan stops. And the Samaritan binds the man up and puts oil in his wounds and takes him to the innkeeper. Who, the innkeeper had no qualms about taking him, saying that he would come back and pay him more. So he must have known him. There mm -hmm. must have been a prior relationship knowing the Samaritan had, in the story anyway, 
a good reputation for doing the right thing, for helping people in a way that he had no qualms about taking this man in and saying, I'll be glad to whenever you come back. Your, your word is good. Oh, what a wonderful thing to be able to say about somebody or about me, that my word is good. So that is where we now take it back. And I'm going to take it back to John, to the question of who is my neighbor? And, and where, where do we need to go with that question? And I hope you spend some time this afternoon asking yourself, <clears throat> who do I look the other way from? Who do I walk across the street from? Hmm. Who do I, you know, truthfully, who do I reject? Because my neighbor is anybody who needs help. So I want John to elaborate on that a little bit. But think with us today. Get into that mode today of who is my neighbor, please. I think it may change your day, it may change your life. John, go ahead. Okay. Thanks, Carol. Um, yeah, and I, I think I think the, the, the I, I like how Carol brought out <clears throat> excuse me the different characters in the story because um, you know we can fit into a, a variety of these characters and and before we get to the Samaritan I, I just want to I want to pause at the expert for mm -hmm. a minute um, and, and I think the expert made some wrong assumptions. Like we all do, we all do. Uh, and, and I, I think, uh, and I think, especially, uh, you know, in telling of this story, um, Jesus is saying that this person is an expert. Luke is writing that this person was an expert in the law, somebody that studied the law, a, a Paul type person, mm -hmm. a you know, a, a rabbi type person. He, he just doesn't qualify him as part of the religious community, a Sadducee, a scribe, a Pharisee, a Levite, but he does qualify him as an expert in the law, somebody that knows the law, knows Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy mm -hmm. uh, intimately. And so this man, as Carol said, asks the same question uh, that the rich young ruler asked, and it's a question that, quite frankly, we all ask. And we should be asking. Yes. How, what do I need to do to have eternal life? And the, his exact question that this man asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And, and I think we, we need to just pause and, and, and say, I don't think this man is just asking about eternity, long life, life after death. I think because he's an expert of the law, because he's a Jew, he knows uh, from reading the law, he's going to inherit. Mm -hmm. He's going to inherit life after death. Mm -hmm. His question, I think, is kind of the question that Jesus answers in John 10, 10. What can I do to have the, the very best life in this moment? Mm -hmm. How can I experience not only eternity then, but eternity now? What can I do to experience the abundance of life, the fullness of the law? Uh, all this law that, that that all that the law talks about in me having, you know, a, a a complete a full relationship with God. How can I have that right now? Mm -hmm. And and I think that's a question that we all ask. How do I get the most out of this life? And, and I think Jesus says, "Well, you're an expert. What do you? What does the law say?" And the guy answers correctly: "To love you with everything I have." That's how I experience not only the eternity in life, but the abundance, the eternal life right now is the fulfillment of the law, the living out everything. And I think it's interesting where the young man, uh, he, he answers correctly. Jesus says, you've answered, do this and you will live. Do it and you'll, and you'll live. And, and in, other, in other gospels in this same story of the Good Samaritan, and, and the guy goes, I've done all that from my youth. Exactly. Like I've done it. Way. I'm doing it. I'm, and, and I think, <coughs> I think number one, number one assumption this man got wrong is that he was fulfilling the law. Number one, I've I've lied, I've done this. I've loved the Lord uh, with all my heart, my soul, my my life, and my strength. And and, and we know he has it because you're supposed to love your neighbor, love your enemies. And he's obviously not loving everybody. And, and it even says in, in 1 John chapter 4, verses 20 and 21, that if you say you love God but hate your brother, 
you're a liar. So this guy is, is proving himself to be a liar even in the moment. And I think the second assumption is, is that, that he feels that he can do that. He can accomplish the law, that he's done this perfectly. He's fulfilled the law. And, uh, and we all know that no one except Jesus can accurately uh, fulfill the law with no deviation. Which so, is why I think he was actually trying to build his case up oh, when I said that he was boasting or being somewhat arrogant. I think he was just hoping that Jesus would say, yeah, you're, you're the, the bee's knees, if you will. You're wonderful. You know, you're definitely, you got it, young man, or, or whoever, how old this guy was. Right. And the guy didn't realize that he was setting himself up for this. Because what does Jesus say? I have come that you would have abundant life. I have it, have it abundantly through me. Right. And here he's got him standing right in front of this guy, and this guy doesn't see it. So, yeah, yeah it, it's just, it's, it's almost, it's so com it's so sad, it's, it's almost comical. Yeah. And, and, and I think the third thing he gets wrong is that, and, and again, we get wrong. I get wrong. Oh, the, third, the third assumption oh, yeah. not... that, that I think there was a belief among the people in, in Jesus' day that the Old Testament clearly states um, you're to love your neighbor. Mm -hmm. As Carol said, it points that out several times. Mm -hmm. We even have Jesus saying in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, verse 43, he says, you have heard it said that you're to love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And, yeah, and then Jesus says, but I say unto you, no. And so you got to say, what was Jesus quoting? Where is that that I'm supposed to hate my enemy in the Old Testament? Well, the reality is, it ain't there. I was going to ask her where it's at, but she doesn't like it when I do that. <laughs> it, Thank it's, you. <laughs> it's not in the Old Testament. Hate your enemies is not in the Old Testament. Matter of fact, um, could yeah. make a case with an eye for an eye. I mean, and I know that's getting into stuff, but you're right. I, there's not, it's not spelled it's out. It's not spelled. Well, yeah. it, let, it, Exodus chapter 23, uh, verses 4, ver, verse 4 and 5 says, If you come across your enemy's ox or donkey wandering off, be sure to take it back to mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. So that's obviously not hating your enemy. And then, and then verse 5, If you see the donkey of someone who hates me, wait, I'm sorry, I read that wrong. If you see the donkey of someone who hates you fallen down under its load, do not leave it there. Be sure to help him with it. So in the Old Testament law, twice it's specifically saying, be kind to your enemy. Be kind to the person that you hate. And then in Psalms 139 verses 1 and 2, uh, David writes, Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord, and abhor those who rise up against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. Count them among my enemies. And God goes on to say, no, that's not what you're supposed to do. There's this concept, I think, and then, then just let me reference back to Matthew chapter 5 where Jesus says, you have heard it said, because Jesus does not say, you read in the law. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that gives us a clue that this was, this was the interpretation of the law that was kind of the happening thing in Jesus' culture that the scribes and Pharisees were interpreting the law where it says, love your neighbors. Well, that means then that I'm to hate my enemies. And so that's kind of where Jesus says, you heard these guys saying that, but that's not what it says. And so I want to just make the point that this guy was listening to those teachers as a lot of us, me, listen to those teachers when I get all particular with the law and says, you know, it, it, nowhere in the... Nowhere does Jesus say this, so I guess it's okay for me to hate these people. And I think, no, we got to back up and, and, and we got to say to this young man, person who is a lot like us in a lot of ways when we're striving for eternal life, and Jesus says, you know, come to me. Jesus says, obey the law. And we say, okay, I'm doing all that, but that one line there I really don't want to do. Exactly. Uh, can I get around? Basically, this guy is asking Jesus, can I just kind of get around that one? I'm doing everything else. This one, can I just get around that? And and we 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 ask that question so hard. You know, I I'm re, I was reminded in studying this about the Super Bowl last weekend. Bucks won, by the way. Thank you. And you know what I thought very interesting about the Super Bowl game is that everybody Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday 
was griping about the officials throwing flags. And I have to just pause and say, weren't they cheating? I mean, were they supposed to let them not play by the rules? That's what the guy in the striped suit is there for. And, and so I think, but in essence, we are saying when it comes to those officials, the same thing that this guy's saying, can't I kind of get around that one law? I mean, it's just one. Yeah. It's just it's one. It. Come it's, on. it's like with if you're making an omelet and you're, you're going to put in six eggs, but one of them's rotten. Well, yeah. we have five good eggs in it, but do you want to eat it? Yeah. It's, it's a little tiny bit, or a little tiny yeast. Yeah, uh, Jesus made that way. point too, goes a long way. And, and I just want to add to what John's saying. Um, back to the, the, the question that we keep coming back to, John and I today. Who is my neighbor? I loved what Barclay said. Who is my neighbor? With any neighbor, a lack of love or caring for the person is easy to justify, but never right. Mm -hmm. Never right. I can have somebody who's hurt me, and I can justify anger towards that person, and I can justify I don't like that person, but that's not what Jesus is telling me to do because a neighbor is anyone of any race, creed, or social background who has a need. Maybe if somebody has hurt me, they actually have a need and I'm missing it. So it's it's made, I guess it's turned me mm -hmm. that I have to be a little bit more open with things and make sure that if I am walking down the street, and I just had somebody the other day say to me, what do you do to people who are asking for money when your car is stopped? And yeah, I had somebody say to me one time, you know what I do? I carry in the car packages of peanut butter crackers. You know, those individually wrapped ones, and you can get uh, six or eight in a big thing. And I hand them one because I know then they're going to eat. I have started to do that, so I'm not giving cash mm -hmm. out. But I'm trying also to say to them, you matter, and I want you to eat. It's a little thing, but I wrestled with that for a sure. long time, That's John. A tough and I wanted to help them. And I so back and forth on that. Who is my neighbor, and how how can I help a situation without coming across <clears throat> holier than thou? And we talked about that earlier. We're not trying to to do that today. We're really both trying to look at who's my neighbor, mm -hmm. right, John? Right. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, and so, so let's, in, in moving along, I, I think Jesus tells a story. And uh, he says on, on the question of who's my neighbor, again, trying to justify himself, um, Jesus tells of two religious people that mm -hmm. didn't do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And I think, I, I think Jesus, Jesus is always, um, is not happy with with the re, those in religious power of the day. He Jesus does not like their choices, does not like their decisions, and um, and and he is not nice to them. Right. I mean, he he paints them always in a very bad color, except for Nicodemus. Um, and and here Jesus is doing it again. The, the the religious people of of his day are making the very wrong choice, and and that's. I wonder about oh, us at ouch, times. Ouch, ouch. I wonder, are we any different? You know, I mean, that's just a tough question to deal with and look at. Are we any different at that point? But then he comes to this Samaritan, and he says, but then a Samaritan came by. And and I don't know, in, in your Bible, in my Bible, there are 10 verbs that the Samaritan does. And I just want to point them out. He says, but the, but the Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was. He saw him, took pity went to him, bandaged his wound, poured oil and wine, put the man on his donkey, took him to an inn, took care of him. The next day he took out two coins, gave it to the innkeeper and said, look after him until I return and I will reimburse you with any extra expense you may have. Sometimes you can get 10, you might get 11 different verbs. Mm -hmm. And I don't think Jesus was just rattling on. Mm -hmm. I think he was mm -hmm. trying to make the point in this story that this man did an enormous amount for this guy that was beat up. He just didn't toss him some coins. He just didn't kind of, you know, wish him well. He didn't do on the other side of the street like the religious people did. This man 
took care of this guy and made sure he was okay. And then the question is asked to the person that we know, which one was the neighbor? And ironically, well, it's not ironically, the, the, the man, the expert of the law couldn't even say the Samaritan, but he said the one who had mercy. Uh, and I, and I, I don't want to make a lot of deal about him not being able to say the word Samaritan, but it, it's a big point. But he did, yeah, he did. He said the one who had mercy. And then Jesus makes that enormous statement, go and do likewise. If you want to inherit eternity of life, abundance of life, go and do what the Samaritan did. And I, I, I mean, that was, you know, that was Jesus whacking the guy upside the head with a 20-pound Bible. Because this guy, the Samaritan, wasn't pure like they were. He Therefore, he wasn't really an ancestor of Abraham like the Levite and the priest were. You know, heritage was very important. Way more important heritage was than doing the right thing. And yeah. Jesus, Jesus took the glasses off and he exposed the, their hypocrisy, mm -hmm. really. And I can say, well, yes, and I'm the Samaritan. But you know what? I better ask myself, really, where do I stack up in this story? Right. And I think that's a fair. Am I the Samaritan or right. am I the expert in the law? I, I mean, I think that's, that's the juxtaposition that Jesus is painting in this story. Yep. We are one of the two. I am one of the exactly. two. The church community in, of St. First Baptist Church is one of those two. Are we the experts in the law thinking we're doing right by maintaining religious purity? Or am I the Samaritan willing to do 10 practical verbs to help somebody? And, and, as, and as Carol asked the question, who is our neighbor? I got to ask the question, who is my Samaritan? Mm -hmm. You know, who is the Samaritan that I deal with on a regular basis? Or who is... Who is the Samaritan group that I wish wish that I wish would just go away? You know, is you know, I mean, throwing up some flags. Is it the LGBT community? Is it the Muslim community? Is it is it is it those silly people on the other side of the political aisle for me? Uh, or is it is it the people that I just don't understand their choices? Uh, you know who who in the who in my community is are is my Samaritan, and we all have them. Mm -hmm. I to some people I am the Samaritan. Exactly. You know I I, I will I I experience Samaritanish behavior from people this summer uh, and uh, and and regularly and and I just we got to ask and and who am I treating as not who am I treating as a Samaritan. And I got to say, Jesus is telling me, John, if you want to inherit eternal life, you got to realize that it's more than just abiding by the law, keeping the legal practices, keeping the biblical mandates, but it's allowing those biblical mandates to change my heart mm -hmm. and, and for Jesus to live out of me. You know, as I was studying for this this week, I realized, you know, a lot of people have hate in their heart. You well, know? And, and I think that... And, and, well, and I was yeah. going to say, and a, a lot of times that hate is manifested. And, and I think what my challenge is for you as we, as we move with Jesus resolutely toward Jerusalem is to say, Jesus, take it away. Yeah, you absolutely. know, Jesus, help me with that. Point it out. You know, Jesus is not going to use a hammer. When we come and say, hey, Jesus, help me with this problem I have in my life. Jesus is going to point it out, but he's going to remove it. And the message is much stronger to the community. One of the greatest messages I ever heard was that the gentleman who killed a woman because he was driving drunk, the mother of that girl later on came back, visited him in jail, mm -hmm. and he and she, now that he's out after serving his time, um, they go to high schools and they witness together. Mm -hmm. And there's a song, I think Stephen Curtis Chapman did the song, um, it's called Forgiveness. 
And it's one of the lines in it is my favorite line. It says, even when the jury and the judge say you have a right to hold a grudge, forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And you know, John, wow. Yeah. Uh, sometimes the neighbor is somebody who might have wronged me, who I need to forgive. Oh, absolutely. Because if I keep that bitterness in my heart, that does me in. So it, the neighbor might not be somebody who's bringing a meal over to me and being precious to me. They might be somebody who's not been nice to me. And I, I, how do I respond to that person? This hit me hard this week, guys. Yeah. It hit me hard. It's, it, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it's very apparent why it's one of those stories that everybody knows. Exactly. It's got, it's, you know... It, it, it like like a lot of passages in scripture I had one of my college professors say it's it's shallow enough for a baby to play but it's deep enough for an elephant to swim mm -hmm. and and I think that's where the you know and, and and I will I would I would in closing uh, echo what Carol said a few minutes ago spend some time this afternoon this morning um, reading it and saying and asking Jesus who am I in this story yeah. and then as Jesus responds to you, I think we have to say then, as Jesus says to the expert of the law, and he says to me, and he says to you, go and do likewise. And with that, God bless you. Have a great Valentine's Day. Yes. Uh, enjoy it. Have fun. Put your mask on. Be wise. Be safe. And be the church. Amen. God bless you. Oh, there's a hand I can see.